we will apply quantum mechanical treatment and uh, on top of the Trude model, which is known as a Sommerfeld model or free electron gas model. And we'll see where does it lead us. So the Sommerfeld model is essentially a Trude model in which we replace the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, so the distribution of electrons, electron kinetic energies, with Fermi-Dirac statistics. The Fermi-Dirac statistics is something that you have heard about before. Um, it is a description of energy distribution of fermions, particles which um, follow quantum mechanical rules, which are so-called half-spin particles. We'll come to both of these things in a second. Let us start talking about the distribution function. What do we understand by that? Each particle in our ensemble, and again, I uh, assume that you have heard this in statistical physics, is essentially described by a velocity and a position. And all, both of these are vectors, right? So the position is essentially a vector, rx, ry, rz, and the velocity is a vector, vx, vy, vz. We have one possibility to label all the particles and say, this is the position and velocity of ith particle. So you can say particle number one, two, three, five thousand, six million, three billion. But this becomes tedious and not always actually possible as we will see later on for electrons. Right? We can't probably label all of them or if even if we can label all of the particles, uh, it might be too much information at the end of the day we might not be interested in knowing exactly a velocity and a position of a certain particle. We would be interested in knowing whether in a certain area of space, a certain place, whether there are particles, if they are there, how many there are the particles, and what are probably the velocities or momenta of these particles. So if we do this really classically, then if we say that the number of particles in a certain space are, which means we have a density of the particles of this space. Uh, right, uh, this, this is the number of particles. Now I, I wrote. Right, so the the d n is the number of particles in a certain uh, area, and then when we look at the number of these particles in a volume in a volumetric element, we get something that is called. Sorry, so again, n r is the number of particle. D n r is the number of particles at a position r, and when we normalize it by the volume, we get a density of particles at this point R. Nevertheless, those particles can have different velocities as well. And so if now we say that F R V gives a number of particles which are at position R and have velocities in those ranges, that means those particles are in a certain um, rectangle or paralleloid in a momentum space. Momentum space is the space where the three axes are given by either the momentum or the velocities Vx, Vy, and set right so when when do we now say that these are uh, the three axes uh, the 
certain distribution of velocities depends only to a certain position r, which we are fixing it. And then we want to know how many particles are in this paralleloid where the edges belong to values vx, and this is vx plus dvx, and so on. And this number is exactly given by the so-called velocity distribution function. This velocity distribution function gives the number of particles by multiplying it with the value dx, dy, dz, uh, so dx, dy, and dz. In other words, by the volume of this paralleloid in the, in, in the momentum space. That means that if I now integrate this function over all possible velocities, so over the whole momentum space, I should get the density of particles at that given point. The density of particles at that given point. And on top of that, we do assume that the distribution of velocities is symmetrical. It means that, or we do not actually need to assume this, but we essentially integrate it over the uh, radial, uh, over the angular coordinates, leaving us only with the magnitude of the velocity. And this will lead to a function, distribution function, which does not describe the distribution of velocities as vectors, but velocities only as uh, magnitude. Why are we interested in this? Because eventually we want to translate this into a function which will depend on a given energy of a particle. And we know that the electrons, if they are free, that means they do not experience any potential, they do not experience any interaction. And eventually, this was the uh, playground that we set via the Drude model. So then the energy is simply their kinetic energy, one half over m d squared. All right. So this is now the connection, how we are going to check the density of particles in a given space via integrating a distribution function, uh, which describes the magnitude of velocities, and therefore the distribution of velocities in the configurational momentum space, and links it with an energy of the particle. When we do this, we arrive well-known Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, or actually when we assume the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, because this is indeed what we did with uh, in the background with the Fermi-Dirac statistics, in which we said that the particles are distributed in terms of velocities, in terms of their energies, as uh, the particles of ideal gas, with their energy being just kinetic energy, and by normalizing this integral, so when we put this expression in this integral and integrate it and say that the result must be equal to the density of particles at that given point, it provides us a specific value for the constant normalization constant A here, which then eventually leads to this expression. We see that here we have now the uh, density of electrons. And we have here the well-known exponential part describing the distribution of, of uh, electrons in the classical form. Right? We can also leave it uh, with the chemical potential instead of uh, evaluating here this, uh, this quantity here, or the chemical potential and the uh, density of particles, the density of electrons can be linked together. Now, when we say our particles are actually fermions, 
They are not electrons, uh, they are not classical particles, and therefore they do not follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, but they have to follow so-called Fermi-Dirac statistics. This distribution function, velocity distribution function, changes in this way, in which we have now again obtained the normalization uh, or we would obtain the normalization uh, by equating exactly this integral, this integral with now the Fermi-Dirac form equal to the charge density to the electron density. And that would provide us with the relationship between the density of electrons and the chemical potential. Numerically, what has changed between these two distributions, just look at it, the major importance is appearance of this term. If you look at the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, we have a constant times one over exponential function E minus chemical potential over KBT, right? And there is nothing here, plus one. This is not in Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. So this is, if you just look at it mathematically, this is the only difference what changes when we go from Maxwell-Boltzmann to Fermi-Dirac. But it has a huge consequences on how the system actually behaves physically. Let us explore this. What we see in this picture is the Fermi-Dirac distribution function uh, at various, various temperatures. The upper part is the Fermi-Dirac distribution function as a function of energy, or actually uh, it is better to say the energy, but the really state of a particle uh, at t equals zero. We see that all states are populated up to a maximum state, state corresponding to the maximum energy, and all higher lying states are unoccupied. If you look at finite temperature, then the distribution at low energies or low quantum numbers, quantum um, numbers describing the state corresponding to low energies, remain pretty much unchanged for us, uh, with respect to the zero Kelvin distribution, but nearby to this highest occupied state at zero Kelvin, the distribution becomes smeared. There is a non-zero probability that certain states just below this energy become unoccupied and that certain states just above this energy become occupied. The width of this smearing, so how far does this go, is roughly proportional to the temperature. So we see that with increasing temperature, this smearing around the Fermi level, and we'll talk about this term later on, becomes wider and wider. It has also a huge consequence when we look at this uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution function and compare it with the Maxwell-Boltzmann. What happens at finite temperature for the Fermi-Dirac we have just described? That is this function with a certain width near to the maximum number, uh, near to the value of the chemical potential at zero Kelvin. The corresponding Maxwell-Boltzmann function looks this way. You can't see too much on this picture, so when we zoom in, you see that we have now increased the range on the y-axis. Then you see the truly exponential behavior. It also leads to the fact that if you are now increasing the temperature, sorry, decreasing the temperature, this exponential part becomes steeper and steeper and sharper and sharper, eventually leading to a distribution that at zero Kelvin 
has a peak at exactly energy equal to zero and is identically equal to zero for an all energies above zero. Well, this is exactly the result that we have obtained in through the model that the total energy of the system at zero Kelvin would be zero. That is also reflected in this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. Speaking about the distribution functions, there is one more important distribution that you should remember, the so-called Bose-Einstein distribution function. Mathematically, it will be similar to the Fermi-Dirac with the difference that instead of having plus one in the denominator, we would have minus one there. This little mathematical difference has a huge, again, impact on the behavior of such an ensemble of particles on its fundamental properties. The particles described with such a distribution would be so-called bosons, particles that have integer spin. Examples of those can be phonons, the lattice vibrations, something that we have met already a couple of weeks ago, and something that I promised to discuss a bit more detail after exactly this uh, uh, Sommerfeld model, in which we introduce the, uh, uh, in which we introduce the individual distribution functions. What is now the difference in behavior of ensemble of classical particles, fermions or bosons? Well, classical particles can be easily imagined as billiard balls. All of those you can track in time. Each of the electron represented by a billiard ball carries its number or its color. They are distinguishable. I can follow a particle ball, billiard ball number one, and at each time I can say its position and its velocity or momentum. It also means that at any time, all particles, all billiard balls, can have exactly the same velocity and theoretically can be at the same place. If you think about, again, this not as billiard balls, where it's hard to imagine that these hard balls would all be at the same place at the space. But if you think about the electrons, in the framework of Drude model, something that we discussed last week. We have never prohibited a potential situation, very singular situation, but a potential situation that all electrons would collapse into a single point in the space and have the same velocity. What would happen? They would all move by the same way, at the same time, all of them would interact. They would collide with a core, with an atom, and would get scattered, at which point each of them gets a random direction of the motion and a random initial velocity. So this singular situation would last by maximum the mean uh, or the, the relaxation time, so the mean time between uh, interactions and afterwards the whole situation becomes randomized but we have not prohibited such situation of course because such a singular situation is a possible state of our ensemble of classical particles despite the fact that we can all of them number and that we can have any number of those particles unlike that for quantum mechanical particles, we cannot distinguish them anymore. Particles become indistinguishable. That means I can't assign numbers to my electrons. I can work only with statistical manner, with a statistical nature of this ensemble, just to say that in a certain part of a space, 
I have certain density, certain number of particles. On top of that, when I speak about fermions, about Fermi Dirac particles, I prohibit two particles to be simultaneously in the same state. That means I cannot have the situation where two billiard balls would be at the same time in the same place and have the same velocity. The velocity described by a vector, they can have the same kinetic energy, they can have the same velocity in the terms of magnitude, but then they would have to have different directions of motion. This reminds you of Pauli exclusion principle. And indeed, this is the underlying principle which makes fermions so special, which makes actually fermions uh, to follow the Fermi Dirac statistics. And like that, bosons, particles with integer spin, they are also quantum mechanical particles, and I can't distinguish them, but I can have at any time in the space and any time. I can have the same or non, uh, larger than one uh, of these quasi particles appearing in the same uh, in the same state. The same state, I mean the same quantum number, and that means to have the same uh, the same velocity vector. This is something that we will be using a lot in our phonon thermodynamics in the next lecture. Today, we'll stay with the Fermi Dirac statistics, with fermions, with electrons. It becomes inevitable for us to dig into quantum mechanics. And that means that we will be dealing a lot with Schrodinger equation, with wave function, with Hamiltonian. We will simplify the situation as much as possible, at least to start with. And that means that our many body wave function, a wave function describing a whole ensemble of many electrons, would be now described within so called product ansatz as a product of single particle wave functions. We say, that each of these electrons behaves and exists independently of all the others. And if we want to have a picture of the whole ensemble, we simply multiply these wave functions of individual electrons. In addition to that, the model we are describing today is called free electrons model, Sommerfeld model. And by free electrons, we mean that we do not have any external potential applied. We do not even consider for the time being the external electric field. But most importantly, the free electrons mean that we do not have any permanent interaction between electrons and other electrons. This is the independent electrons or between electrons and the atomic force. Once again, we are in the Drude model. The Drude model, the electrons do not know about the atoms, about the atomic force, apart from the infinitely short time during which they interact, by which they reset their state, their velocity, and they get scattered. It means the Schrodinger equation corresponding to such model, an ensemble of free electrons, does not contain any potential. And the Hamiltonian that we have here acting on the wave function that we are looking for, the Hamiltonian here is simply corresponding to the kinetic energy. So we do not have any potential energy and the operator of the kinetic energy is indeed this minus one half h bar squared over m nabla.
I believe that this is something that you have seen in the basic quantum mechanics course. We'll be using this a lot. So what can we do with this, right? Well, we can say that in this case, the wave functions can have any shape. They can be anything. The only requirement is that they must fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle. And by Pauli exclusion principle means that each state is populated by maximum one particle. What does that mean? Well, firstly, if I evaluate psi star times psi for any number i that I'm choosing here, to describe my n electrons. If I evaluate integral of this form over the whole space, I need to get one. This expression has been interpreted in basic quantum mechanics course as a probability of finding a particle i at position r. It means if I integrate it over the whole space, I get the number of particles in this state. And from Pauli exclusion principle, we know that they cannot be more than one. And of course, if this integral would lead to zero, that means this state is unoccupied, this is uninteresting for us. We want to describe populated or occupied states. The other requirement that we have is that the particles must be independent. And this independency would lead to another form of this equation in which we would require that any two particles, if they are integrated again, the psi i star, so the complex one you get times psi j function. So I calculate the probability of those two particles being correlated. That must be zero. The two particles are independent. So I need to find out now a set of these functions that fulfill the Schrodinger equation. And at the same time, they fulfill all of those uh, all of those conditions. The Schrodinger equation looks probably complicated to you, but if you rewrite it in one dimension, in one dimension, it would read simply minus h bar over 2m, second derivative with respect to x of a function psi x equals e times psi x. In other words, minus second derivative of a function equals to a constant times a function, the same function. Oh, you have seen that, right? But eventually, second derivative equals constant times a uh, function itself. Uh, you know immediately what are the forms of the solutions. Those are trigonometric functions. The, fun the solutions of such function are sine x and cosine x functions. So indeed, when we combine now all of this together, together with the requirement that the functions have to be perpendicular to each other and so on and so forth, it leads us to a natural choice for the solutions of the Schrodinger equation in the form of plane waves. The prefactor here comes from the normalization factor, from the factor that in the state k, we have to have exactly one particle, one electron. Mm -hmm. uh, the corresponding dependence of energy, the eigenvalue from this function, on the index k which at this point just indexes the individual solutions is given by this expression. 
this expression reminds you already on of the expression for kinetic energy. We'll come to that in a second. In addition to that, when we consider that our solutions now should be in a crystal in which a certain periodicity must be repeated. In other words, if I have a lattice periodic system with a distance between the periodic images given by distance L or more traditionally A as the lattice constant, and we require that the density of electrons at position R and R plus an lattice vector must be identical. So when I move from one point to another point by a lattice vector, I must get the same distribution of electrons, the same density of electrons. Otherwise, it's not crystal, otherwise, it's not lattice periodic. That would lead us to the relation between the lattice periodicity in this lattice vector and allowed vectors that index our solutions. Eventually, the allowed indices, those which lead to the solutions which are lattice periodic or lead to a lattice periodic charge density, those are given by 2 pi over L, where L is the lattice periodicity, times a triplet of integer numbers. We are again arriving at the reciprocal lattice. Those guys, they must be uh, a reciprocal lattice vectors. When we put this together, we can also see that the value HK in this form is actually an eigenvalue of an operator of momentum. So indeed, when I apply a momentum operator, which again from quantum mechanics, you might remember that this is minus h bar gradient, then the expectation value of this operator when I apply it on a function psi k is h bar k. What is the expectation value? The expectation value is a value that you expect to get when an operator acts on a wave function, when an operator acts on a state described by this, uh, by, by this wave function. You can imagine it in a more intuitive or more simple way as an operator being a request into your hidden world, hidden world described by the wave function. And it just says, hey, provide me with momentum. This is what momentum operator does. It does it mathematically in this form. You essentially put a hand in your black bag, which is your wave function. And out of that, you draw an answer to your question. The question is, what is a momentum that describes to this black bag? If you have another bag, another situation described by another wave function, and you apply the same request, that means you apply the same operator, again, you get a wave function out of uh, You get a number out of it, which tells you the expectation. Of it. If you do not now calculate the expectation number, but if you would just calculate or you would let this operator act on your wave function, means you are calculating only such object, which is what we are effectively doing here. Why? The answer that you get out of it will be another state in general will be another function. If you look at the Schrodinger equation, here is your operator. It's a mathematical object and it acts on a given function. 
and you get a certain answer. Now you say that solutions to your problem are such functions which provide the same function as you put in, only scaled by a vector, by a number. This is a special situation. Such functions are called eigenfunctions, eigenstates of that operator. And the numbers are called eigenvalues. The operator of momentum acting on a state psi k, where psi k is this function, gives a value, if you look at it, one over square root of v, uh, i k e i k r. This is now the derivative of the psi k times minus i h. So what do we get out of here is that if you look at it, i times i is minus one times uh, minus one is one. And we get here that this equals h bar k vector times our wave function of psi k. This plus this is the wave function of psi k. So we got this very special situation that the solutions of the Schrodinger equation of this form, the solutions in the form of the wave functions are also eigenstates, are also eigenfunctions of the momentum operator and the values that it yields, the eigenvalues, are h bar k. That eventually closes the loop that allows you to say, okay, if this is an eigenvalue, the expectation value of the momentum operator, you eventually plug it in here and you say the energy corresponding to the state described by an index k is a momentum squared over 2m should be the expectation value right the expectation value of the mom of momentum operator but this brings us back to the classical mechanics where we know that the kinetic energy is the momentum squared over 2m so for free electrons that means electrons which do not experience any interaction with atoms with the atomic force and for independent ensemble of uh, electrons that means the electrons do not interact with each other then the energy corresponding to a state given by such a plane wave is only the kinetic energy corresponding to this state the allowed states are given by vector k this is now uh, replacing our indices one, two, three, up to n in the independent electrons product ansatz form. And the allowed values for this wave vector k are reciprocal lattice vectors. So what are the consequences? Uh, if we would again, uh, speak about a particular space in the in the reciprocal space it contains a certain number of lattice uh, of reciprocal lattice vectors right uh, or what what are what are those reciprocal points that we have in a certain space between k and k plus dk so kx and k plus dkx. Well, there would be dk over 2 pi over L states, dkx. That means if we want, again, to calculate the density of states, 
the same way as we did at the beginning when we calculated the amount of, uh, let's say, states corresponding to a certain small, infinitesimally small volume of the momentum space, we would end up here with a, a density of states which corresponds to 2 pi over L cubed, where now L cubed is a volume of our unit cell with the periodically repeated pattern. So we will typically write this as 2 pi over V. Uh, sorry, that should be four. Two pi to the power of three over V. But now we have to be careful in each of these, uh, uh, sorry, and this is not, uh, right, this is the density, but now in each of these states, we have two particles. That means the final sort of uh, space, uh, the, the final volume of the reciprocal space per one state is only one half of this value, leading to the formula that we have here, four pi to the power of three over V volume. Please note that this form that we have here, this density of points of states in the reciprocal space corresponds to the situation where we have three dimensional problem. If we would have a lower dimensional problem, then obviously this exponent changes because this exponent corresponds directly to the uh, dimensionality of our problem and the expression of the volume per state would be different. All right, so now we have the reciprocal space and we have all possible states given by a lot of points, right, in the reciprocal space. And I'm drawing a 2D situation for the simplicity, kx, ky, but I'll be treating it, calculating it as three-dimensional. And now we are interested to know what is the highest energy corresponding to the occupied state at zero Kelvin, Or which of these points each of those dashes that I draw on here corresponds to a point, corresponds to a one state of, of an electron. Now, remember, energy scales as h squared k squared over 2m. At zero Kelvin, we want to have the lowest energy, lowest possible energy state. That means we'd say at a certain volume in the space, we have one electron. It means we occupy the state with the lowest energy. Well, that's obviously the one right in the middle, right? With kx and ky and kz all equal to zero, yielding energy equals to zero. Now we say, well, we have a higher density. We have actually two electrons per uh, unit volume. That means we need to occupy two of those states. But can I put two electrons in this state? Well, yes, I can, because they would have an opposite spin. This is the one quantity we haven't spoken about yet, which makes really electrons the uh, fermions. But we treat this intuitively for the time being, and we say that the electrons can occupy, both of them occupy the same state equal to the origin of the reciprocal space, and they would have opposite spins. It means they still have a different state. They have identical kx, ky, kz, but opposite spin. Good. We take a third electron. 
And now Pauli comes to the game. Well, we can't have any more a third state here because for the same x, y, uh, k, y, k, z, and k, y, we already do have used all the possible spin states with spin up, spin down. We do not have any more options for the spin. That means the only way how to fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle is to move to another point in the reciprocal space, to another triplet k, x, k, y, k, z. Which one do we choose? Well, we choose the one which yields the lowest energy after the energy equal to zero that we have already used up. And the energy is proportional to the distance squared from the origin. That means the states that lie on a circle with the smallest possible radius that go through some of these points will be the next available states. After I use all of those, I have to move to another circle of states. All of those states, they have identical energy, energy equal to the distance from the origin squared times some constant. Uh, their number increases with the increasing energy. How many states do we have? Well, we have, uh, we have a density which corresponds to uh, V over four pi cubed. This is the density of states per reciprocal uh, unit volume. But how many states do we have inside of such a sphere with a certain radius? Well, the sphere has a radius 4 third pi k squared. Sorry, of course, k cubed. So this is the volume of a sphere, right? And this will be the number of particles in this, uh, in this, or the number of states uh, corresponding to a given point R in the real space and having the lowest possible, uh, uh, lowest possible energy at this point. So when we now evaluate everything together, hopefully it will come out. So we have N over V equals, Da, da, da. K cubed, and we are left here with one over three pi squared, which will be finally three pi squared times. This is now the density of the particles, with the position r, of course, and then we take a third root of this, and that gives us the radius. All right, but now if we need to put in a certain number of particles, we know what is the density at that given point. We of course can use this formula to estimate what is the radius of the sphere inside which are all the states which are occupied at zero Kelvin. And this radius is so-called Fermi radius. And the formula that we have just derived is exactly what is given here. The particles at this Fermi radius have all the same energy. This energy is called Fermi energy and is simply calculated by putting the Fermi radius into the formula for energy, leading to an, again, relationship between the energy of this highest occupied state at zero Kelvin and the density of particles at a given point. We can also use these formulae to define 
thermic temperature simply from the fact that we say energy equals KBT, where KB is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. So we define the apparent temperature of these electrons corresponding to the Fermi energy. So the apparent temperature of the uh, electrons at the Fermi level. We can also uh, use the classical formula, which assigns to a given momentum. And we know that the momentum for the uh, free particles is now h bar kf, where k is the Fermi radius. So this is the momentum of the particles at the uh, Fermi level, those with the highest energy. And we can then use the classical formula uh, to assign them a velocity, so-called Fermi velocity. To give you an idea, what would be the values of those quantities describing a free electron gas? Uh, for typical metals, you can have a look at this table. You see that the Fermi temperatures, Fermi velocities are extremely high, despite the fact that we describe a situation at zero Kelvin. Right? So this is the lowest possible configuration. And still, in order to have a charge density and electron density corresponding to, for example, copper or silver or gold or other metals, we do have velocities of electrons, which are fractions of the speed of light at zero Kelvin. Right? So the electrons, they will never rest. They will never rest because of the Pauli exclusion principle because we require that the distribution function of electrons fulfills the Fermi Dirac statistics. We can now try to go to higher temperatures. We can try to estimate, um, well, actually, no, we, we stay for the time being at zero Kelvin and we estimate the total energy. Apologize. For so what we do here is that we say for each K, we have two states for each K, for each point in the reciprocal space that corresponds to a state of an electron. We have two states, spin up, spin down. And then in order to estimate the total energy corresponding to a given density of electrons, we need to sum up all occupied states. All those states have electrons in, all those electrons have energy corresponding to the Hamiltonian eigenvalue, what we have shown on the previous two, second previous slide. I mean, since the density of the points in the reciprocal space is so dense, is so high, the K points, we can't really distinguish that they are discrete. We will now replace this discrete sum with an integral in which, once again, we put in here the density of states or the density of the key points. The real density of states is the value that we have here, the density of key points times number two, two for the states up and down. And then we multiply this distribution, this density of states for a given k point, uh, for a given value of k. We multiply it by the corresponding energy. So we get the distribution times the quantity. And when we integrate over the whole configurational space, over all occupied states, we get the value of, of the desired quantity here, the total energy. So now this three-dimensional integral can be also transferred uh, to a one-dimensional integral by taking into account that the distribution of the key points in the reciprocal space is homogeneous in all directions. This comes again from our free electron model and therefore we integrate from this three-dimensional or triple integral, we integrate over the angular coordinates 
after which we are left with only the radial coordinate. And then finally, we integrate over this, over all occupied states. That means from zero, from the lowest velocity to the uh, Fermi radius, and we obtain the value of the total energy. Now, this value of the total energy is not a total energy corresponding to the whole system, but correspond, it is the total energy at a given point. So if you want to have a whole total energy, you would need to take this, this value that we have here, E tot, and now integrate it over the whole space. E, E. This fact, this value that we have here, depends on the Fermi radius, and the Fermi radius depends on the density of electrons at a given point R. So in fact, the Fermi radius is a function of the position where we are in the real space in our particle, right? In our, uh, sorry, in our sample. Good, but we'll be talking from now on always about the densities, that means about the spatial distribution of certain quantities. The important fact is, if you remember from the previous slide of these values, the Fermi uh, radii corresponding to metals are extremely high numbers at zero Kelvin. Obviously, all the other values here are either fundamental constants or non-zero values, both mass of an electron as well as uh, a volume of the unit cell are non-zero values. And that means that the density of the total energy is a non-zero uh, quantity. We are at zero Kelvin because that is where we have evaluated the Fermi radius. We calculated the total energy density and the value is non-zero. We compare this with the result from a classical gas, which corresponds to the uh, Drude model that we described last week. Indeed, this is the formula that we have used to describe the uh, kinetic energy of a single particle, the average kinetic energy of a particle. We see that this is linearly dependent on temperature, meaning that at zero Kelvin, the value, the mean velocity, mean kinetic energy is zero. Because all the particles at zero Kelvin would occupy the lowest energy state. The lowest energy state is the state with the lowest kinetic energy, which is with kinetic energy equal to zero. And therefore the total energy would be zero, zero Kelvin. Consequence of the Fermi Dirac statistics of the fermion behavior is that the total energy, even the total energy per atom, uh, sorry, per electron is non-zero at zero Kelvin. We obtain qualitatively different behavior between the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics applied in the classical gas in the Trude model and the Fermi gas, gas of fermion particles, which fulfill Pauli exclusion principle and which properly describe electrons. This is the fundamental difference between those two approaches, which leads essentially to the difference between classical treatment and quantum mechanical treatment. If those integrals are too lengthy for you, too difficult to grasp, then this result, the difference between classical and Fermi gas, is something that you have to tell me even if I meet you at midnight at Hauptplatz when this is allowed again. It also allows us to 
calculate the density of states. The density of states will be eventually a task, your homework that I will put on Moodle soon, and you should calculate for differently dimensional tasks. How you arrive at this formula is that you try to evaluate the number of particles. which are inside of a sphere with radius k, which has a volume 4 thirds pi k square uh, cubed, and in a sphere with radius k plus dk, which has radius, uh, sorry, which has volume 3 uh, 4 quarters pi a plus dk cubed. This increase in radius, you have to relate to the increase of the energy. And so you would be eventually able to say how many particles are between those two spheres. En will be and now we have a density of the particles, which is two times um, volume over eight pi cubed times well, four thirds pi k cubed minus uh, uh, blah, 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 k, k primed. Let's say you can't probably read that, right? Uh, da, da, da. Let, me, let me let me come back a bit. We can do that. Uh, we have space here still, right? So then we say we are writing the number of particles, which is two times volume over eight pi cubed, and then we have. So this is the density of particles now. The volume in the reciprocal space is 4 third pi k primed cubed minus 4 third pi k primed, uh, k to the power of 3. Uh, now, what is k? We know that h squared k squared over 2m equals energy. So you express from here the relationship between the K and energy. So K equals 2MA over H or squared square root of that. And you now need to express also uh, how does this volume change for K primed. K primed equals 2M e plus de which is the change of the energy over a squared this is now the critical part where you now need to put this expression in here this expression in here apply taylor expansion to it neglect all higher order terms so you would end up with after the linear term expansion which would lead eventually just to the term corresponding to the DE, and you would get the number of states. How does it change with the number of, uh, uh, with the change of the, of the energy? And this number of states, how does it change with the energy? This is called the density of states. So GE is the number of states per unit energy. So this is this is exactly what you get as the N, right? And uh, actually, this is not right. This is, uh, right, the N over the E. This is what you get here, right? So if you now 
do all this evaluation that I, I showed on the previous slide, and you end up with that, you will have that the number of states available per unit energy is equal to this formula. Now, this formula here is valid for 3D. And your task over the Easter break would be to get a similar formula for also 2D materials and for 1D materials. Now, you would see that they behave fundamentally different. Whereas here, we get that the number of available states goes as a square root of energy. So if I plot here the energy and here the density of states, this is how it looks like. You would end up with saying that for 2D materials, the density of states does not depend on the energy at all. The density of state is always constant. And for 1D materials, it even decreases with the number of, uh, with the energy, the energy of the highest occupied state. So you get fundamentally different behavior based on the dimensionality of your program. And this is the basis for the high interest in so-called two-dimensional or low-dimensional materials, because they exhibit fundamentally different behavior uh, compared with 3D bulk materials. Good. The remaining slides I will uh, leave for your consideration, what we are trying to do now is to evaluate the total energy at high temperature. For those of you who are fans of mathematics, please go through it. For the reminder of you, look just at what those equations state. How are they formulated? What we want to do is now to calculate the density of the total energy at finite temperature. What do we do? We want to calculate density energy. That means we need to take all possible values of energy, multiply each value of the energy by how many states we have available. This eventually describes how many values of the k vectors you have available for a given energy. And then you multiply this result by how many states are really occupied. In fact, this is this part was what we did on previous slide, even without stating that explicitly, because there we formulated this whole integral as from zero to the highest occupied state, energy times the density of the states because at zero Kelvin, we know that this Fermi Dirac distribution function looks like a step function. Everything up to the highest occupied state is occupied as a, uh, this Fermi Dirac distribution function equal to, zero, uh, to one. And for all higher values of the K vector, we get uh, we get probability of being occupied equal to zero. So this form that we used on the previous slide is exactly the same as this one by considering the Fermi Dirac distribution function at t equals zero. And we are not in the lucky situation that t is equal to zero, and we try to consider everything at finite temperature. And then you go ahead, you do all of this math that you can go through yourself by applying, again, the normalization condition between the density of electrons, you obtain eventually the temperature dependence of your chemical potential. You obtain that the chemical potential is weakly dependent, weakly for low temperatures, weakly dependent on temperature. 
Of course, with increasing temperature, this dependence becomes significant, right? But let's say between zero Kelvin and room temperature, we can pretty much neglect this temperature dependence. Now we take this uh, dependence explicitly into account, put again, everything together, those equations, and we obtain the temperature dependent part of the total energy of our electronic system. So this value was what we obtained at zero Kelvin. This is the part which is zero at uh, in the Drude model. And now we have here a certain correction of this value as a function of temperature. We see that it has a second order in terms of temperature correction. It actually is not only second order because we have the chemical potential here as well, which then would have to be evaluated from this equation four. So it's even weaker than that. Now, when we assume really that at room temperature or below, the chemical potential is independent of temperature and we set it equal to Fermi energy, we can simplify we can simplify this equation simply by putting here mu equals to Fermi energy. And then we calculate the electronic heat capacity that is the energy that is needed to be put in our system of electrons uh, in order to increase the temperature by one degree Celsius or Kelvin does not matter, right? The heat capacity here is per mole or per unit volume. Since we, when we put everything together, we arrive here at the formula which links it with the density of electrons, the spatial density of electrons, the heat capacity that we have here expresses the energy that is needed per unit volume. We obtain an expression as it's here, and there are two interesting facts to be noted. The first one is that we recognize here a prefactor, which we also obtained in the Drude model. However, in the Drude model, it was not a prefactor, it was not part of the heat capacity, but it was the whole heat capacity. In Drude model, we obtained the heat capacity was constant. Now we obtain that the heat capacity is linearly dependent on temperature. And this is the significantly different result because it means that the heat capacity at zero Kelvin, electronic heat capacity at zero Kelvin is zero, and then it linearly grows. Unlike in Drude model where the heat capacity was constant. When we compare the uh, heat capacity that we obtain from the Sommerfeld and Ruder model at room temperatures, we see that we get roughly the factor of 100 that we mentioned last week when we compared the, or when we discussed why did the uh, Ruder model yield it such a good result for um, Franz Wiedemann law. We have mentioned that there was a certain error cancellation and that in fact the Drude model overestimated the heat capacity by roughly a factor of 100 at room temperature. This is exactly the factor that we are getting here. Uh, we would also see next time that the heat capacity that we obtain in Sommerfeld model is reasonably well describing heat capacity 
at units of kelvins but whenever we go to higher temperature and higher still means probably dozens of kelvin right we still can be at minus 200 degrees c but as soon as we go away from units of kelvins the heat capacity that we obtain solely from sommerfeld model would be significantly off with respect to experimental values and the reason is that we are including in the total energy only the contribution to the electrons. Once again, heat capacity describes the energy we need to put in the system in order to increase its energy by one Kelvin. Now we say the value that we have here is the energy that we need to put into the system to increase the electronic distribution so, or to increase the temperature so that the electronic distribution corresponds to a uh, one degree higher temperature. But we do not say anything else what happens with the rest of our system because we focus here only on electrons. What do we have in the system is at least the atoms. And we already know what would be happening with increasing temperature. The atoms will start vibrating with vibrating, they will also start gathering energy. And so in order to increase the energy of the whole system of a real crystal, not just the electronic cloud, but the whole system corresponding of electrons, uh, consider, uh, co co uh, containing electrons and atoms, we need to pump in the energy, both in electronic and the atomic part on the crystal. And it will turn out, and we'll show this explicitly, that the heat capacity corresponding to phonons, to lattice vibrations, the energy we need to put into the system to initiate the lattice vibrations, scales as t to the power of three, and will be completely overruling these electronic, uh, electronic contributions at finite temperatures. And the very final note here is that the Franz Wiedemann law eventually uh, can take um, into consideration the result for the electric conductivity that we have uh, that we have derived last week within the Drude model. The reason for this is that when we look at the uh, mean free path, uh, the one that we get from the uh, Fermi velocity, when we really treat the Fermi velocity as the velocity of the fastest electrons, those which really carry the electric current, those which are excited, right? uh, and we compare those uh, with the uh, Uncertainty principle, we see that our electrons are well localized, in fact, with respect to this mean free path. This statement that I have just made leads to the conclusion that the classical treatment that we have applied in Druda model would be still applicable for the uh, ensemble of electrons in Sommerfeld model. It means that uh, for the heat capacity, we eventually use the formula from last week. Whereas for the thermal capacity, we now put in the improved velocity instead of the velocity coming from the distribution of the classical gas. We put here the velocity corresponding to the uh, uh, to the electrons at the uh, Fermi sphere because those are the carriers that are really moving, and we also put here the now newly derived heat capacity corresponding to the electrons. In those two parts, we have the error cancellation, so we have the uh, roughly 100 times smaller heat capacity now and roughly 100 times larger velocity. 
squared. And eventually, the slightly modified numbers corresponding to the uh, different, uh, to, to the evaluation of the uh, relaxation time and, uh, and the Fermi velocity and so on, lead to a small changes in the absolute values that come from this fraction where we have the uh, heat capacity over electrical, oh, sorry, not heat capacity, the electrical conductivity over, uh, the heat conductivity over electrical conductivity times temperature. Uh, and the absolute value increases roughly by factor of two. So the agreement with experiment is even better than what we got in the Trude model, where it was already astonishing. It remains, again, the same order of magnitude as uh, experimental values. The values now are numerically almost identical with the experimental values. That's the fact that we have it now twice as large as in the Trude model. However, the ratio of kappa over sigma t remains temperature independent, remains real temperature, uh, re remains real constant, unlike the experimental measurements uh, that were shown here last week, where it was weakly temperature dependent. That brings me to the very end of today's lecture. Again, hopefully roughly in time. Um, we have uh, discussed in detail the introduction to quantum mechanical treatment um, of an ensemble of electrons, which led us to the replacement of Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics with Fermi-Dirac statistics. We've also discussed briefly what is the meaning of the Bose-Einstein statistics that we will be using last week. Based on the free electron and independent electron um, assumptions, meaning that we have no interaction with atoms, we do not have electrons experiencing any external potential. And the electrons are indeed independent, so they do not know about each other. It means we can apply the product ansatz. Our Schrodinger equation thereby simplifies to the really the simplest possible uh, situation. We are able to provide the solutions in the form of plane waves, by which we eventually defined the indexes labeling individual states, the k vector uh, or the electron plane, uh, the, the momentum vector k. We have shown that h bar k is an uh, eigenvalue of a momentum operator in the case of free electrons. We have designed, uh, the, the, the derived or defined a plenty of different Fermi-based uh, quantities. Those properties describe the free electron gas at zero Kelvin. Right? So whenever I talk about Fermi energy, I talk about the uh, highest occupied state, the energy corresponding to the highest occupied state at zero Kelvin. And eventually we were able, using the distribution of electrons from the Fermi, and, uh, from the Fermi Dirac statistics and the density of states, we were able to calculate the total energy of this ensemble of electrons, which we then used for calculating of the heat capacity. I highlight here once again, that this is the electronic heat capacity. We shown that unlike in Trude model, where it was constant uh, in Sommerfeld model, the heat capacity is linearly proportional to the temperature. Eventually this led to the improved value of the Franz Wiedemann law, uh, which was pretty good already for the, um, for the Drude model. Uh, we do not see that when we look at the quantities, but the fundamental improvement here is that uh, we have corrected the error cancellation that appeared in the Drude model. And uh, we do not do anything to the whole 
effect, the fact that the all uh, constant derived in Bruder model was always uh, ne negative. We never got the positive values. We never got the uh, temperature dependent dependency of this uh, of this constant. This is related to the fact that the transport properties, the electronic transport properties, uh, eventually the uh, conductivity of uh, metals are independent in our description of whether we use the Drude model or the Sommerfeld model. And therefore, this application of quantum mechanics does not lead to any changes here. So the deficiencies in describing Hall effect in Drude model remain also in Sommerfeld model and wait for more accurate descriptions, which will include also the atomic force.